Hello everyone, I'm uh, back with a, a special video here. Um, I've been recently become aware of Jordan Peterson as an individual and, and some of the controversy that certainly surrounds him. Um, and I've, I wanted to start sort of deep diving into what it is he's talking about and the various ways that it's being portrayed in the media. Um, so I wanted to start with the video that I started with, which was the where I first became aware of him, which was this interview on CBC's uh, YouTube channel um, from the Weekly Insider with Wendy Mesley. Um, let me just switch over the video here. So basically, um, it's a one-on-one inter -on -one interview between Wendy and, and, and Jordan talking about you know these various controversies that he's involved with around C-16, which is the federal bill that was an amendment to the Human Rights Code and to the uh, Criminal Act in Canada, uh, the Criminal Code, I think it is, uh, that um, uh, allow, you know, added protections for trans people. So people who identify as uh, gender identity that is not uh, the single of binary. So if, if you're born physically male, you don't identify as a male. Uh, you, if you're a female body, same thing. Uh, so basically, um, it could be that you identify as the opposite gender. That's certainly the far more common uh, permutation, but uh, there can be anything you might feel, identify as both genders or neither gender. Um, it, and it's a very large community that's become much more visible in, in the last 10 years, uh, and certainly even the last uh, uh, couple of years has become a, a very much more visible group so uh, but he's had some very specific critiques about the legislation uh, and so anyway this is the interview that's that's my context with when he's going to give her context at the start of the interview um, and I want to stop it in a couple of spots just because uh, context matters and and this is an analysis of the the job of reporting on an issue in, in many ways. And, and, and there are many flaws I find with this interview. So, uh, but just for the record, I'm very much in favor of these types of measures. It's more about the accuracy and the, and the methodology that are, that are put in place to execute um, these types of protections that, that are really the issue here. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's uh, start with Wendy's video here. Welcome back. Every week we interview a big name in the news in the Weekly Insider, and this week it's Jordan Peterson. The Canadian psychology professor is somebody people love or love to hate. Peterson gained national notoriety in the fall of 2016 when he spoke out about a federal bill on gender expression and a U of T policy to call students by their gender pronoun of choice. Peterson says there shouldn't be laws forcing people to use specific language. I Okay, so before we get into his clip, um, that's a pretty good summary, neutral. I think it's fairly neutrally stated about the issue and the controversy and his specific position. So uh, now I want to talk, let's play the audio clip that she chooses to, to represent his side of the story. Uh, and then I'll pause it before we get into the actual interview. Uh, let me just rewind this a second. Forcing people to use specific language. I can envision a student or a colleague insisting that I call, call them using gender neutral pronouns, G or jure, I think it is. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Um, now, I'm gonna have to find that source and I might make a special little bit addendum to this video um, because it's taken very much out of context and if you do more of a deep dive into his what he says he does clarify um uh those remarks in many ways and but it's there's certainly if you just take those remarks as they were shown just now out of context um, and you are of a left-leaning perspective um certainly if you're in a, a, a lgbtq uh, friendly perspective um that might be, that's easily perceived as a, uh, you can obviously get a very negative reaction in that sense. So it's a very polarizing clip played without context. So let's continue. Person called it freedom of speech. Critics called it transphobia. 
and protests ensued. But then on YouTube, uh, okay, no, Dube, he's a star. His lecture topics range from personality to advice for young men. And the videos have scored more than 36 million views. He's huge on Twitter with 365,000 followers. And on the crowdfunding site Patreon, he hauls in $65,000 a month. Could be as much as three quarters of a million dollars annually. Joining me... Okay, so, few things to note here. One, the imagery is very important when you're presenting the news. So the type on television news. So the type of imagery that they're choosing are painting a picture. You're providing context to the story. So now we've seen imagery of people protesting, and we've also seen uh, both in visual and in her the language she used and what she said, um, in that he's making a lot of money. So there's a lot of people on the left that are very upset about him, and this guy's making a lot of money. So again, you're, she's starting to portray this portrait of a person who's anti-left, pro, you know, and out for a buck. Uh, which, uh, again, she's not out and out saying it, but she's laying that groundwork for the viewer to reach that conclusion themselves. And that's very dangerous, uh, especially if you aren't adding that, if you aren't you know, being obvious in your context, you're, you're making it subjectors or, su or um, sorry, not subjective, uh, subconscious. It's a, it's a more subconscious way to manipulate the, per the, the person, the viewer. So anyway, let's keep going but just keep in mind that we've already got a tilted playing field here and this is before the interview has started and the other well sorry one other thing i want to note here is both at least the part that she shot at the very beginning um well may or may not he may or may not have been present in the room but it was a one shot on her so there wasn't and, and that part especially the over uh, the voiceover bits where showing the actual video clips of the protesting and and his website and, and talking about his money um it's not clear that those were shown to him. I don't know if he was aware of that context. It's something that I'd be curious to find out from, from Mr. Peterson, um, is how much of that preamble he was actually uh, given context. So he understood where the CBC was coming from. Because again, if you're, not com if you're coming at this blind, the CBC is pushing an agenda here. Um, and that, it, it, at least that certainly is what it appears to be. And that is dangerous when you're supposed to be reporting the news in a neutral fashion. Anyway, uh, let's continue on. Is U of T professor Jordan Peterson. He's got a new book out called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. So Professor Peterson, you must be exhausted. You've been giving all these speeches and sold out performances and it's quite something. Are you? It's crazy. Sorry, <laughs> I was just was listening there, but I just noticed, let me go back a second and I'll actually, this might even answer my own question. Uh, but you can listen. There's a different quality in the audio uh, of her voice. So these, there are two separate recordings. These were recorded at separate times. Jordan Peterson, he's got a new book out called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. So, Professor Peterson, you there we go. must right be there. exhausted. That was the switch. You saw there was a, a, her voice is suddenly more full-bodied. So that was pre-recorded before she got to the studio, would be my guess, or at least before they got to this interview and sat down. Um, and that was rolled. So, again... The CBC is already trying to push the audience in a particular direction before the conversation even begins. You've been giving all these speeches and sold out performances and it's quite something. Are you... It's crazy. How do you explain what's going on? You're, you're now called Canada's most powerful intellectual. How do I explain it? Yeah, what's behind this? What are the forces that have made you so popular? I tell archetypal stories. I think that's it. I mean, I, the search... Sorry, I just want to stop right here. Uh, I, I just oh, well, two things. If this might, if this is annoying to you, please I'll put a, the link to the original video in the description. Watch that first, and then come back. Um, just because uh, I'm going to be doing this a lot. So, uh, but just as go there. Uh, so what he just said, he he speaks in archetypes. This is something I've noticed in in patterns in in his interviews in various media, both. Uh, sort of more conservative and or mainstream media, as well as some of the more uh, web. Uh, like YouTube channels and, and, and more uh, new media uh, sources in that he talks in archetypes. So he's talking abstractly about a subject and he's talking about the majority. Uh, and this is something I, I want to make clear because he it's one of the things that he doesn't do, unfortunately, is he doesn't clearly denote that there's a two, there are two conversations that they're going to be had here. His is a conversation about the average man the average woman 
and he's talking about general traits. But he is very clear when he is talking about the generalization, uh, generalization in, in, in certain points where he's, he's very clear to, uh, to go into specifics when necessary. Because when you do talk in generalities, it can be very easily misinterpreted, especially if you take the leap from talking about the average person to all people. And that's where you're going to find a lot of this uh, you know, sort of alt-left, I almost want to use that term, sorry, um, just because I can't think of another way to describe it. it it's, a, it's, an, a, it's a poison that's in news reporting that has this leftist bent that is a similar poison to the one that's on the right. It's called the alt-right. So um, where you're, you, it's, it's, like I said, it's not, it's a lack of precision in the language of what they're talking about. And, and so, and you're going to find that a lot of the arguments that are being put against him are, are taking that leap from what he says, where he's talking about archetypes. So he's not talking about every man and every woman. He's only talking about what statistically is provable as the average. Uh, and again, when those averages are, are wide and, you know, vastly different between uh, men and women, then it's, it is an important conversation. But like I said, it's, anyway, I, I'll let the conversation go on and we'll, we'll, we'll keep going from here. Lots of things that I've been talking to people about are old things and they're the things that people always need to know. And Your so, message has really seem, seemingly resonated with young men. Why, why is that? Well, because young men have been fed a diet of, on the one hand, let's say rights and impulsive freedom for 50 years, but rights aren't as useful with regards to establishing what's meaningful in your life as a responsibility. And so, because most of the things that people find deeply meaningful in their lives have to do with responsibility. You know, your responsibility of your career, your resp the responsibility of your education, responsibility that you take on for your family and for your broader community. The world is so polarized now. You've got mm -hmm. Donald Trump and social media and people screaming at each other on all kinds of different political issues. Are you part of that polarization? It's a good question. I don't think so. Um, the reason I don't... So, just wanted to stop there again. So, I pay very close attention to the questions that our reporter asks. There is telling about the reporter's thoughts and ideas as they are about how, the, as, a, as, as useful as they are as a tool for shaping a conversation. Um, reporters have to be careful about what types of questions they ask because the narrative is defined by the questions you choose. So, She's already asked if he is a representative of the alt-right. Um, and if you, anyway, I guess it's, let me, let me, let me like keep, keep playing, I'll, I'll come back. I don't think so, is because I've had hundreds of letters from people now, maybe even thousands of letters from people who've told me that they had become increasingly attracted, for example, by the blandishments of the radical right but because they'd been listening to what I was saying online, they decided that that was a very bad idea. And I don't like right-wing identitarians. I think they play the same game as the radical leftists, which is identity politics. They just play a different version of it. But I'm no fan of the radical right. I've been lecturing about the dangers of Nazi totalitarianism, for example, for almost three decades. It's been a major part of my life's work to inoculate people against that, the attraction of that sort of thing. After your speaking out against the uh, the federal bill C sixteen and gender pronouns, sorry. Before we get into that, just just because it was the topic he was talking about, um, so in in other interviews and uh, uh, my other research that I've had in in sort of working on this, um, Mr. Peterson's been very clear that he's both anti-fascist and anti-Marxist, and he views them as opposites of the same sort of problem. I, I, well, maybe not necessarily that. I wouldn't want to put the words in, in his mouth. And <laughs> I don't want to be guilty of the same thing that many reporters are in trying to speak for him. Um, but um, but you, those are, like I said, he's very much trying to put himself in the middle of the conversation, not far any degrees. Not He's for moderism and, and, and discussion. Um, let's get, keep going here and so on. Uh, the federal government cut your funding for research. Uh, Rebel Media came in and did a crowdfunding uh, project for you, raised about $200,000. Mm -hmm. um, after Charlottesville uh, and the riots, the protests there, uh, many people cut ties with Rebel Media, including the Conservative leader Andrew Scheer, saying mm -hmm. that it could be seen as giving hate groups a platform. Um, you still go on there, so I'm wondering 
why do you go on Rebel Media after, after Charlottesville? I mean, you don't think we should talk to people on the right? So that's why? I talk to people who want to talk to me, generally speaking. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be careful about it, but I don't see any reason not to talk to people who are on the right. I talk to people who are on the left when they want to talk, which is very, very rarely. I've read a lot of what... Okay, so... I, I find this, again... Uh, well, one very comforting in that he, he does seem to be genuinely reaching out to anyone who will speak with him. Um, and obviously, many of the points that he talks about can will resonate probably far more with uh, the right than with the left in, in a great deal part because the our right and left side of the spectrum, and, and perhaps this has always been true, but especially now, has become increasingly polarized into the right representing a masculine form of political expression and the left representing a feminine form of uh, political expression. And this does not mean to say that uh, it is a woman's voice on the left and a man's voice on the right, but it is simply the traits that are statistically most associated with those with each gender. Um, are, you know, those are masculine traits or feminine traits. This is something that fairly universally should be acceptable. We should all understand that, um, you know, there are certain traits that, that are much more common in women than in men. It doesn't mean that they are exclusively the domain of those genders, but statistically speaking, um, they're distributed in those proportions. So anyway, uh, let's continue. But you've posted in the last year or so. In fact, you're very careful about saying, please so the, so, be less well, So then there's a real question there, is given that you've, that you've, uh, you know, you've encountered the material I have, why do you think that all this, all these accusations have been leveled at me? Well, I don't know. That's, that's what I find so curious. Cause it's I, convenient. Because I also found this <clears throat> picture of you with Okay. Behind well, the pet, that is that you? Now, this is one of those points where, uh, let me, before I get into this, let me just say I, I've been watching the CBC my entire life. I'm, I'm a big f proponent of a free and open CBC, well funded to be able to report the news to everyone in a neutral fashion. Um, and Wendy Mesley is a long time part of the CBC and I have tremendous respect for her in her career. Um, and I don't know, you know, where she personally feels about this issue. I can only talk about the CBC as a organization and that this is a product that the CBC is putting out there. And, and she is at the heart of many of the problems that I have with this type of news coverage. Um, so, he, you know, Mr. Peterson just asked, uh, I don't know, i got to make sure, sorry, this is my own personal habit. I'm learning on doing this thing on the fly here, and I should call it, uh, I should either call him Jordan and her Wendy or him Mr. Peterson and her Mrs. Wesley or Miss Wesley. I do, do not know her marital status, and this is a problem. So maybe I'll just use Jordan and Wendy here. Um, apologies for the non-formality of approach to the the two individuals i'm again just trying to be equitable here but so wendy um uh here basically um acknowledges well he uh, i found this interesting that he that jordan turned the question around on her and asked her why do you think that there's all this criticism directed towards me be, uh, specifically because she admitted that she had done her research and she'd gone and watched and and you know, un tried to understand his position and she admits that she doesn't know um, why there's this um, uh, why there's this opposition being painted, why there's this painting portrait being painted of him of being you know closely tied to the right when he's again in his communications when if you listen to him in an unedited and un uh, manipulated fashion certainly seems to indicate he's far more in the middle. He doesn't, uh, he's, he's, he, again, he, even in this interview earlier, he just said he wasn't for either side, I think, or certainly wasn't for the alt right in that far right fascist kind of approach. Anyway, so, like I said, it's just there's some humor or, or and sadness, I guess, bitter sweet humor in this and that. 
you know, she just said, I don't know, admitting that she wasn't sure where this, you know, this particular portrait was coming from. But then she jumped right into an ex specific example of where this is coming from. Um, she's just showing this photo of uh, Jordan with a couple of fans who held out a Pepe flag, uh, this frog icon, which again uh, has become uh, in the public sphere on both sides of the conversation, um, closely identified with the right. Although, uh, again, it, it, there is some argument about how much it's representation of those uh, uh, those ideals and how much is just an appropriation of that imagery uh, by that group. So, but that said, this is not relevant to the conversation. This is a hit piece here um, where, and we'll, we'll let me play the video and, and I'll come back to exactly why I think that. You, I mean, it's you, but I mean, that's an actual <laughs> yeah, that's photo of you. You me. did that? Yeah. yeah. So this is the, this is the Pepe flag. Mm -hmm which I'm sure you know is seen by the left as a hate symbol. And, yeah, and, well, the, see, the left it, sees all sorts of things as hate symbols. But symbol. it's used by the extreme right as a, a way of spreading messages. It's been it's seen as an alt-right symbol. It's this mostly, is, it's this is an alt-right hand symbol, and here you are. <laughs> it's mostly used by young men who are poking and causing trouble on social media. That's mostly what it's used for. But you're and supposed to be mostly... anti-chaos and anti-provocation. I'm just wondering why you would choose to <laughs> that's actually a good question on her part saying that you're you're supposed to be anti-chaos because there is some truth to that um but let me continue on here be in this photo well i've probably had my photo taken with five or six thousand people in the last no but year, this is so. with a pepe flag i understand i mean that. you know yeah. that that this is now seen as a as a symbol for the old the well old i did a video online called the metaphysics of pepe with Jonathan Paggio, who's an orthodox carver of icons. And if you, if people are interested in my views on what's happening with this particular symbol and why it's occurring, then there's a two hour discussion about that. Richard Spencer wears a pep, he's a white supremacist. He wears the Pepe symbol. It's become adopted, I'm sure you know this, by, by the far right. And here you are holding up a flag like it's, it's a joke. So I just wonder if, if it could be misinterpreted by people that you're trying to send a message that Pepe's cool well, I think it has been, cool. I think it has been misinterpreted. I didn't know when it was happening. I mean, it's hard. I don't know what you mean exactly. There were a lot of people lined up. They were doing a lot of things. This was one of the things. It took about 30 seconds. Um, I would also say it's the one thing, well, it's the one thing that, that, that has been photographed that the left in particular has been used, using against me for the last year. But it was just happenstance more than anything else. Do you know? So. Before we continue on here, I wanted to stop and reflect on what was just said. Um, you know, uh, so this was a photo that was taken. Like you said, he gets thousands of photos every um, every year. I think he said. Um, and certainly, I would expect it certainly looked like it was a photo taken at some sort of either a convention or perhaps a book signing. Which, of course, he's out on book tour right now. Um, uh, he, in fact, uh, so perhaps it was some people that came up in line and asked to take a picture, which obviously, like you said, he gets pictures taken hundreds of thousands of times. And so he may not have had the opportunity at the time to, one, realize that that was what was going to be done. It's possible that the amount of time it takes to uh, stand next to somebody and hold out a flag is, is something that... Uh, could be a matter of seconds so and especially if you're you know when you've got a huge lineup of people hundreds of people or, or you know which is what usually these types of events would entail um you're trying to get through everybody so you can't spend too much time with each person and you're, and you're also you're switching from co topic to conversation to conversation on a rapid manner it can be very i imagine it can be very difficult to uh you know to sort of to get that amount of perspective that perhaps if it was a isolated incident um he might reflect differently on it. But again, we, I believe this conversation does go further into that. So let's keep playing. Okay. Most of the people who are using this sort of symbol are using it in a deeply satirical way. Now, the fact that the far right has decided that um, it's, it's, it's a, what, a radical indicator of, of the validity of their particular view doesn't mean that that's what it is. So 
It's something that we haven't seen before. There's a it's lot of we, game playing going yeah, on there online. Is a, there is a, a lot, lot of game playing. So, again, um, you know, the, the other side of the argument, the other part of the argument that he makes is that it's no guarantee that the, you know, that that symbol, again, he's, the, this is a symbol that is used as a trolling symbol online. It can be, you find it a lot in things like Reddit and whatnot, and, and it's not, it, the context can often not have anything to do with an alt-right perspective just because it's a used as a, it's not what its origin was. Um, so, anyway, I, I think that's enough context. Let's keep playing. And there's a yeah. lot of sort of codes and dog whistles and so there on is. on all sides being sent. Here's another one. This is a, this is a tweet that you sent out, Keck Boys, which is... So, again, she's admitting that there are dog whistles and, you know, this really, you know, again, it's noise. It's noise being added to the conversation that has, that, that prevents a real intelligent discussion of the issue, the underlying issues uh, to be had. And yet that's exactly what this interview is in many ways. She's bringing out these dog whistle shows and, at, and confronting them with them. And it's, you know, instead of actually talking about the underlying controversy, the actual issues, it's, you know, this, we're wasting time. That's what this is. This is a, we're so far in, we're seven minutes in, and a good portion of this, especially, like I said, that Pepe flag conversation, waste of time. This one coming up, waste of time. It's kind of like mm -hmm. another Pepe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that's been adopted by the extreme right, Code Pepe. So yeah. you are, you're using this to reach these people. Yeah, but well, are, I can tell you about that. Yeah, well, because you want, this, sure. this is your course, right? So you want yeah, them a program. to, I to want take them, your course. I want them to plan their futures as responsible individuals. What does it say? Keck boys, trapped in chaos. Seek your fortune, right? Don't stay in the underworld. That's why I'm talking to them. I'm trying to call them forth as individuals out of the chaos that they're ensconced in. So that's you're what helping that's them, for. but they're helping you too. You raise a lot of money. Well, what do you think? What do you think should happen in this polarized world if you're dealing with people that you think are being attracted by a pathological ideology? What do you think you should do with them? What I do is talk to them and say, look. Why don't you make yourself into an individual and get the hell away from the ideology? And so a lot of these kids are lost in the underworld, let's say, in nihilism, and they turn to these ideological solutions because they don't know what else to do, and they're angry. It's like, I have something better for them to do. Grow the hell up and sort yourself out as an individual. And so that's, and that's exactly why I made this particular tweet. And so, and I get letters from people all the time who say, look, you know, I was moving towards the fringes. And I'm not doing that anymore. I see why it's wrong. So you're, you've become this huge sensation. What's... Sorry, I just want to stop again here. So I, I do like how Jordan seems to be able to, um, to redirect these types of attacks on him, where, they're, where again, there's a, 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 an agenda being pushed and he's able to deflect it into a more neutral conversation in some ways. And, and, and this is a good example where, again, she's bringing out this shocking, you know, supposedly racist imagery and trying to capture a getcha moment by confronting him, getting him to try and trip up and admit that, yes, he's a face of the alt-right. When, again, he's trying to be very particular to expressly say that, that not only is he not a face for this particularly, you know, vile uh, approach to conversation uh, that he's, you know, actively trying to fight against it. And then, like I said, I think it's interesting that he's taken, he's, he's trying to use uh, the sim symbiolo symbology and, and language of the people that are involved in this conversation to hijack that conversation and try and get them into a more neutral position to try and improve themselves instead of, you know, shouting at the void, which is what both the left and right, this extreme left and extreme right perspectives are doing is they're just shouting at past each other. There's no conversation going on. And this is, you know, we're, we're you know, incredibly starved of people who can talk about things in a moderate tone and, and really, you know, talk about the issues and get into the details and talk about things in a way that is neutral and, and is not about trying to win an argument, but try to, you know, gain better understanding of each other. So um, let's continue on here.
next for you? Like, I'm trying to figure your, figure out, are you, are you the next Marshall McLuhan? Are you the next Billy Graham? Like, are, are you a, a prof or are you? Bill, that's two very different people to try and throw at you. And um, I would certainly argue that he's far more Marshall McLuhan than Billy Graham. Um, but again, it's, it's this, you know, there isn't an honest attempt at conversation for a lot of this interview. It's just about trying to, you know, create this, trying to reinforce this, this very far left attitude that anybody who's in opposition to any issue, you know, any of their, you know, it's a, it's very much a, you know, buy in a hundred percent or you're not, you know, you, if you're not with us, you're against us. And it's not, you can't have conversation when that's the approach to every conversation. It has to be, well, here's my position. Here's why I, why I think this here's, you know, well then here's my position. Here's why I think this. And then you get people sharing and discussing the differences and trying to find consensus. Um, that's, like I said, by far what I've seen in what he's communicating, that's what he's trying to do. That's his approach and that's what he's trying to do. But he's being confronted by, you know, media personalities and media organizations that are trying to steer the narrative in a particular direction and are blatantly ignoring facts or fuzzing the details so that it helps fit into that narrative. So it's, it's not a honest, you know, pursuit of the truth. It's a biased pursuit of the truth and it's causing issues. Billy McLuhan. <laughs> I don't know what's next, really. So you're a prof prophet? Well, <laughs> well, you know, we're in, a, we're in a new world in many ways because of the reach of social media. And so I have this immense multimedia platform and I don't know exactly what to do with it. I mean, what I'm doing right now with it is making videos that I think are useful to people, interviewing people that I think are interesting to talk to, but I'm sort of shaping this as it's developing because there's no way of predicting it. And the, the, the overwhelming likelihood, as far as I'm concerned, and it's been this way ever since September of 2016, is that this will go terribly wrong. That's the most likely outcome. I've known that ever since I made those what videos. What do you mean by that? How would it go wrong? Oh, well, things go wrong all the time. You know, I no, say but something... What, what are you afraid of? saying something inappropriate. Well, you've said lots of things that have made people angry. That's not the same thing. So wh why? So I, I just wanted to pause there because that's a really, it's very important to notice the differences um, where he's um, saying something inappropriate versus saying the wrong thing, I think is what she said. Um, uh, maybe I'll just let him talk and we'll come back to it. Sorry. How would you say something inappropriate? because people make mistakes. Mm. And so like I've been in a situation, I would say for 15 months, really, where I'm speaking publicly and, and I've been in front of the news media a lot and people are waiting. Well, they're waiting with things like this to say, look, well, you made a mistake here. It's like, yeah, well, I've done like 10,000 things in the last year and maybe I made a mistake. Did you? Hard to say. I mean, I don't think, the, I don't think that I, uh, the discussion I had about Pepe, I don't regret that at all. When I put up on YouTube, that's the serious discussion. I think I understand what's going on with the Keck boys and with Pepe a hell of a lot better than the people do who are, you know, casual observers of it because I've actually studied it. And so, no, I don't think I made a mistake. I think it's, uh... no, I don't think I made a mistake, hmm. no. So, and I think that that's the case mostly, as I said, because of all the feedback I'm getting from people who say, look, um, you straighten out my life. And so that's good enough. And I'm hoping that will continue. I think it's unlikely that it will continue in a positive direction, but you never know. It's too much. Eh? Okay? That's the thing. It's been too much for a long time, but so far so good. And I'll write it out it as well as I can. But I'm surfing a hundred foot wave. And generally what happens if you do that you, is that you drown. That's interesting. So, and, and she's right, that is interesting. Um, and that's, you know, him showing a very, you know, very big self, sense of self-awareness in, in that he, the spot, he's feeling the spotlight on him. And, and I, I imagine that's got to be terrifying uh, in many ways, personally, just because the pressure. And, and as you said, it, he's afraid to mess up. And, and that's, I, I, but I stopped for that point. Um, 
you know, we have to allow for the conversation to, and, and the people involved in the conversation to make mistakes, as long as they're willing to, uh, you know, upon a more sober reflection or upon being presented with information perhaps that they didn't have in the first place when they first made their statements, um, as long as they're willing to, to re-examine those opinions and then, uh, you know, that's really all we can ask for. And it's, it's where, but we're in such a polarized state right now where it, you're not being asked to, you know, very often to reconsider your assumptions. Um, we're being fed a, a, you know, two comforting narratives and the information's being altered by both sides to fit those narratives as opposed to, like I said, an, an unvarnished assessment of the facts as best as can be done. Mistakes will be made, but it's the pursuit of truth is being held for you know, for, you know, as the primary desire, then that's a good conversation. And we're not having that now. It, we're now settling for, like I said, uh, uh, comfort on, uh, in, you know, reinforcement of the biases we already have, as well as increased fear and hatred being directed towards those who don't share those same biases. And it's very dangerous. Uh, and, and it isn't just for, for people like uh, uh, Jordan here. Um, who, uh, you know, who, who, like you said, he's riding a, a thousand foot wave and it can come crashing down and down on him at any given moment. And, and uh, at some, you know, it's just a matter of time in many ways. It's a, you know, but it's the same thing for our societies. Our societies can only shout at each other for so long before it's, you know, it comes to blows and, you know, it's not going to happen today and it's not going to happen tomorrow, but. You know, you can't say that, that that is a, you know, the only thing you can say is that eventually it will happen. Uh, eventually, if we keep at this divided conversation. Um, sorry, it's I should It's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Nice to talk to you as well. Sorry, I just realized I had left it on her face in a very unflattering uh, situation. And, you know, I, sh I shouldn't uh, do that. But uh, again, because again, I, I, I just as from my own experience of having uh, watched uh, Wendy Mesley on CBC uh, for you know, a good portion of my life. I, I have a lot of respect for uh, the tone of the conversation and, the, and you know, uh, even when, you know, when she was asked questions, she listened. Um, but that said, there are, there are greater issues with this sort of package. Like I said, I don't have a problem so much with any individual player as much as I have with the packages that are being produced, the content that's being made, and and how it's being made, who it's being made for. Um, so, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for this video, but I'm going to go deeper into this issue, and uh, specifically, I'm going to play. I'm going to do this for a couple of other videos. Um, there's a uh, channel for the UK. There's an interview with him uh, that I, I'm going to go into, but it's a longer video, and it's going to require a lot deeper dive into this. So. Um, I'll try and get that done for tomorrow, but, uh, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for staying through this. If you did all the way through, I appreciate it. I'm, uh, again, this is sort of a new experiment for me. Um, but I'm just trying to share my thoughts and, and, uh, try and encourage that, uh, that moderate conversation in the middle in much the same way that people like Jordan Peterson are doing, or at least trying to do, um, uh, now, I, uh, before I guess before I wrap up here, I just want to say I, I, I am going to provide more critique of some of the things that he says, um, but that'll come in the Channel 4 video just because it's, a, I, it's more obvious in some of the uh, conversation um, because they get to talk more about the book that he's, that he's written and, and I want to talk about how that both the audience that he chose to write for the book write the book for and uh, how that's affecting negatively his ability to interact with the media as well um but that's a conversation for another day so anyway thank you very much uh if again if you paid through if you stayed through all this i appreciate it very much uh, but please come back and uh for uh, the next part of this conversation thank you